All right. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we know a lot of our attendees have joined webinars throughout 2020. We appreciate um, the registrations and just joining us for another great session today on empowered planning during uncertainty. Um, before we get started, just a couple of reminders. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be made available to you. You'll get an email copy today with a copy of the slide deck. Additionally, the copy of the slide deck can be accessed anytime throughout the webinar. You'll get a link in your chat feature. Speaking of your chat feature and your Q&A, questions are welcome throughout our presentation today. So go ahead and send those in. Our speakers will be able to read those. If we can't get to everything today, we'll respond via email. So we have a lot of great opportunities. We look forward to hearing from you. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started today with our speakers, John Prinia and Anthony Licavoli on PPP loans and legislative updates. John and Tony wanna go ahead and take us away. All right, thank you, Sam. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, as the topic states, empowering uh, planning during uncertainty. Uh, we certainly have a lot of uncertainty uh, with us right now, and hopefully knowledge um, will help you be much better planners. And we'll, we'll try to give you as much as, as we know right now, um, what might change in the next uh, maybe 48 hours as it, as it relates to certain legislation that we're gonna get into. And then talk about a little bit about how to plan as it relates to this. And, and Tony and I will be focused mostly on the PPP and the tax side of things before the other speakers get into their respective topics. So let's start out with where are we now? What do we, what do we know? Well, I, I gotta take you back in history a little bit to kind of set the stage. So let's go back to April. Actually in February and March, you probably were mostly uh, busy trying to apply for the PPP loans, running through the calculations, getting the forms put together. That all went, um, other than it was very busy time and hectic for everybody to pull that together, uh, went fairly well, but then all, lo and behold, in April, at the very end of April, Treasury issued notice 2020-32 and brought up this topic that they feel in their position that the expenses used um, uh, in, in the payment, I'm sorry, the payment of expenses that came from the loan forgiveness would be non-deductible. Put everybody into a bit of a tailspin, understanding that we understood it was going to be uh, uh, tax-free that uh, we knew the, the loan was going to be tax-free, but we didn't, we didn't expect that the expenses were going to be disallowed. And the more we talked with um, those legislators, that wasn't their intent either. So we've been waiting, anxiously waiting since that time frame to, to get better understanding. And as I said, we may see that by the end of the week. Then in, in November, uh, about a month ago, revenue ruling 2020-27 was issued that said the reporting of income and the non-deductible expenses are to occur in the 2020 tax year, regardless of when the forgiveness occurs. So you may not even have filed for your application, but if you were reasonably, you had reasonable expectations, I don't wanna say reasonably certain, but reasonable expectations that the loan would be forgiven. And in most cases, um, if you're less than a $2 million loan, that's probably everybody's situation. Then you had to report it in tax, in the tax return for the 2020 calendar year. If you're a fiscal year end, it creates a little bit more issues, but let's just leave it simple for now and say it has to be reported. They followed that up immediately with revenue procedure 2020-51 that provided a safe harbor that basically was that if you're not gonna get forgiveness, or you decide to give your loan back or repay it without uh, applying for forgiveness, well, then you don't have to pick it up in income. And that would make sense that, that you wouldn't have to do that, but they issued revenue procedure to do that. All, all this time, since we've been dealing with the non-deductibility, as you can imagine, there's a lot of, of tax people out there um, looking through the code, looking through regulations, citing cases, trying to figure out, was Treasury correct? Uh, were they correct on the argument that Section 265 applies, which is the non-deductibility issue? Were there other avenues to uh, get around the rule of non-deductibility? And while we've seen a number of articles, uh, each of those positions are very aggressive positions, and we've decided to hold back on those, at least for now, because, again, our hope was that the future legislation was going to correct that problem. We were getting reasonable assurances from our congressmen and senators that that was of interest and they were going to make it happen. So that's that's where we are now. 
Now let's look to the future. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying long into the future, 48 hours is, is what we're hoping. By 12.01 uh, a.m. on Friday, we expect that the um, uh, ECRA, the Emergency Coronavirus Relief Act of 2020, could get signed. And in that legislation, um, there contains a whole number of PPP part two and kind of the, the fixes that we've been talking about the deductibility. We know that the HEROES Act made it through the House, but didn't come out uh, and go to the, uh, didn't make it through the Senate. This takes a lot of those, and I've heard it referred to as the, the Slim Heroes Act or, or other acts that were proposed, it's a slim down, but it's, it's pretty effective in, in what it, it provides. Um, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of those items, uh, just so you know, we've got an additional 300 billion in funding um, to the small business through the SBA. The second round of PPP available for small businesses, those hardest hit with 300 or fewer employees, and a 30% revenue loss as you measure quarter to quarter, first, second, third, fourth, and it's as it's written, it's an or, so if your first quarter or your second quarter or your third quarter or fourth quarter um, have a 30% sustained loss in gross revenue, um, then that uh, will apply for, or those individuals will apply for this new eligibility. Some 501c6 organizations will now be eligible as long as they're less than 150 employees and not lobby firms. And here's the big one. Business expenses paid with PPP loans do become tax deductible. And again, we're crossing our fingers that everything will go through appropriately. They expanded the $75,000 to $150,000 for the simplified forgiveness application. Um, and there was a number of other items including, and I think that maybe Susan will be cover, covering some of the labor items, additional federal unemployment and et cetera. So she'll get into those. So I said, that's, you know, that's gonna be really important for us to keep our eyes open until Friday morning when we get up and look at what's, uh, what's been passed. If it doesn't get passed, the next opportunity would be when they come back from recess unless they extend. And um, so we're anxiously awaiting what happens at 12.01. The other 1201 on Friday morning. So the only other thing I wanted to point out is the, the, the planning. So right now, based on what we know and what we think might happen, um, the, the when to file question comes up a lot. And, and we have been encouraging people, if they have the opportunity to postpone filing, you've got 10 months past the, the, your closure um, uh, coverage period. Why would you want to file if we've got all these things that are unknown and maybe some things that are going to provide clarity? So the opportunity to wait, it's not going to hurt you, um, might make more sense. So we're still in that category, at least through, um, at least through Friday. Um, and then after Friday, we'll, we'll make uh, decisions and try to help our, our uh, customers with PPP loans make those decisions. It might settle up the issue of non-deductibility and therefore there should be no reason to hold off finally. So that's where we're at, Tony. If you wanna, do you have any comments regarding uh, that information? Yeah, yeah. So a, a couple of things I wanna mention that I just read right before this. So one thing that was not included in the um, initial uh, proposal that was that came out on Monday was additional actual stimulus payments to individuals. So that would be the, uh, the $1,200 or the $2,400 that you got earlier in the year. Now, I just read an article on, on political that mentioned that as part of the negotiations that took place last night, that there is a potential for a $600 uh, payment to come from that as well. So, uh, you know, the, the what, what John had talked about was a, you know, a, a proposal that came out, a bipartisan proposal that came out earlier in the week. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of meetings yesterday, and it's going to be altered in some form for sure. But I, I know there is. Uh, a few on the Senate and um, House side on both the Democrat and Republican side that said that they will not vote for any bill that does not include some, at least some type of direct payment to individuals. Um, so, so that may end up changing as well. And then the, the only other thing I wanted to mention on that is that there was a, a second bill that came out as part of this, which was the, the Bipartisan State and Local Support and Small Business Protection Act. And that included some of those more controversial items that were preventing a stimulus package in the first place. So that included the, uh, the liability protection and the state and local uh, funding um, that was really holding up this from, from the start. So uh, Sam, if we can move on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about 
uh, some of the uh, Biden tax proposals that came out, um, I don't want to spend too much on time, time on this because I know we've talked about this on some prior webinars, but you know, the, the first thing before we get to those proposals, I do want to point out that um, as th these were part of the campaign. So, uh, you know, they wh whatever ends up happening after this point, these will ne not, you know, there's very little chance that these proposals come out in their exact form. They will be subject to change and they will change if anything gets passed. And, and the second item I do want to mention is that Congress may end up being split. Um, between the the House control to the Democrats and the Senate control to the Republicans. So um, that will depend on what happens with this Georgia runoff election, um, where, where two Senate seats are up for grabs. Um, the more than likely, uh, I was looking at the odds today, uh, it was about a, a 60 to 70 percent chance that the Senate is state, uh, stays in the control of the Republicans. So um, with, with that being said, these proposals, even if they were passed in their exact form, um, for what we're going to discuss, would have little to, I, I would say, little to no chance actually making making it through the Senate. So, so keep that in mind as we actually go through some of these. So, if, if we're looking at the proposals, you know, big picture, uh, the, the Biden plan is really focused around the idea of there's going to be tax raises for. Uh, certain groups of taxpayers to fund a lot of government programs and government spending programs. So programs like infrastructure, which has been discussed for the past, I don't know, I want to say the past decade, um, and, and also to fund credits and incentives for other groups of taxpayers. So talking about raising taxes for certain groups, well, uh, the first group that we want to talk about is anyone making over $400,000. And whether or not you're looking at a single individual or a married couple, you know, I don't know because, again, these are just proposals at this point. Uh, but that 400K is the, the line in the sand that the Biden campaign has sort of set to where they have promised numerous times throughout the campaign that they are not going to raise taxes for anyone making under that income threshold. So, some of those proposals on there, we're not going to walk through every one, but you know, the the first thing is increasing that top tax rate from 37 to 39.6 percent for anyone making over that $400,000 threshold. Uh, the second item on there, and a pretty significant one, is, is subjecting earnings over $400,000 to the Social Security payroll tax, and that would include both the employee as well as the employer side. So that would be you're looking at I want to say close to a 12, a little bit over a 12% tax increase on wages above and beyond $400,000. And that would be split again between the employer and the employee. And then there's a couple of deductions that are in jeopardy if you're over that income threshold. And that is the qualified business income deduction, which was or is that 20% deduction that was part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that applies to your pass-through income. So your income for your partnerships and for your S corporations as well. And then the itemized deductions would, you know, would be a target for this. Um, they would be subject to some potential additional limitations as well as some additional phase outs as well. Again, if you're making over that $400,000 threshold. And then one other item I wanna talk about is the potential state tax change. But actually, let's go back. One, one other item I do want to talk about on the individual side is the uh, is applicable for anyone making over a million dollars. So this would be basically taxing qualified dividends, taxing your capital gains at ordinary income rates. So again, if we look back or if we look at that slide, presumably that would be 39.6% under this proposal. So, you know, this would uh, again, this provision in particular would only apply to individuals earning over that million dollars, so not that $400,000 threshold. And then to wrap up the individual side, you know, we have some potential estate tax changes that are on the way. Um, some low-hanging fruit would be, you know, to reduce the overall exemption to end up raising the estate tax rate. But they've also, the, you know, the Biden campaign during or during the Biden campaign, they've also proposed eliminating the step up in your assets in the basis at death. And this can uh, kind of be done in two different ways, uh, if it is done at all, but you can either inherit 
your assets or inherit the assets at a historic lower basis. And then you'd actually recognize that gain when you sold the asset or all unrealized gains would be taxed at debt. And that would be a, a very significant change to our current estate tax system there. So uh, just a couple things on that right-hand side, if we're looking at our business proposals, you know, we have a, an increase in the corporate tax rate being proposed. This would be um, something that could definitely get a lot of support. Um, you know, the, the Biden proposal calls for a 7% increase. So going from 21% to 28%, um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine it go back, you know, not back to 20%, 28%, but up to 28%, just because if you're looking at the, um, the, the overall effective tax rates uh, worldwide, that would again put the United States, uh, if, we're looking, if we're taking into consideration state and local taxes, Going up to a 28% tax rate would again put us towards that top uh, top tier as far as worldwide taxes. So 28% might be a little bit too high, but I can I can definitely see something like 25% getting some support and being thrown around as well. And then the the last two items on that slide kind of combined together, it's it's the idea of you know protecting and incentivizing U.S. manufacturing. So it you know, basically the proposals um, take a, a carrot and stick approach. Again, on the stick side, you know, the the proposed thing is a, a, a some type of surtax on corporations that offshore manufacturing and then go ahead and sell back into the United States. So how that would actually work, I have no idea, but that was thrown out there. And then on the carrot side would be a, a some type of credit or incentive um, to basically expand manufacturing payroll as well as actual production within the United States. So, uh, you know, a lot to look forward to. Uh, well, maybe not look forward to, but a lot to be thinking about on, on both, you know, as, as John said, on the short term within the next two days, again, with that, that new stimulus bill pending, uh, as well as any potential changes resulting from the, the, new, act, the new administration coming in in, in January. So, John, I don't know if you have anything to add, but uh, if not, I have, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. I got, I got 30 seconds of answering a couple of real quick questions before we hand over to Lisa, if that's all right. Lisa, I don't mean to take up some of your time, but uh, question, will the second round of PPP loans uh, be available to companies who received the initial PPP? There's nothing in the act that, that would indicate that you're precluded from filing for the second round. In fact, the narrative that we're hearing is exactly that for those customers that really, those those uh, those um, uh, businesses that really need it, and then they're focusing on the small businesses. I, we've not seen anything that would preclude it. Again, it's not final draft or final written yet. It could change, but at this point in time, it doesn't seem it's precluded. Um, the let's see. If you've already applied for forgiveness, is there a risk that your expenses with the PPP would not be deductible if the bill is passed? And she says, it's I think from Lynn, the comment about holding off perked her ears. The holding off was really just so that you can have a better idea when you're filing. It has nothing. And the holding off might, might go more towards if they don't settle it in 48 hours, what happens in February, March, and April. You certainly don't want to file a tax return until you've seen hopefully some evidence of closure on this matter. Uh, and and in, in everything we've written, it's, it's clearly retroactive to the beginning of the PPP. Um, recognition of terms for forgiveness that some businesses were significantly hurt by the pandemic. Um, I'm not sure, Jerry, if I understand your question. I tell you what, Jerry, uh, uh, maybe um, send us an email and we'll try to respond to it. I'm not sure I understand your question. Yeah, John, I'll, I'll just yeah. add on that. There was, yeah, I, I've got the summary up right now and there is some, you know, I haven't read the actual statute on what it says on the proposal, but there is something for uh, not restaurants, but something specific, uh, at least for uh, items, live venue items like movie movie theaters and uh, it looks like museums on here. Um, but I don't see anything specific to restaurants on that list. But again, it, you could just yeah. apply for the generic PPP uh, second round, anyways. Okay, and then uh, are you Tony available? Are you um, got information on the FFCRA? I'm not familiar with that. I I have not seen anything about that being extended. 
So okay. I, I'm assuming we're talking about the related uh, paid family and paid sick leave as well. And I have not seen anything on that being extended. Yeah, Susan, oh, you may Susan have information on that. She's saying no as well. So, yep, we haven't heard anything yeah. about extensions. All right, Lisa, sorry to take over a little bit of your time. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. No, great questions. And I am going to cover my material at a pretty high level. I just want to start off with the uh, state approach to the PPP loan forgiveness. So something to keep in mind if you didn't have enough to already put um, and put out there and think about is that the states don't necessarily have to follow what's happening for um, the federal. And of course, generally when they're not following it, they each do it in their own unique way. So keep that in mind. Um, don't assume that just because you're not picking it up, uh, picking up the income for federal income tax purposes, that there might not be some states that require you to, especially some of the gross receipt states. Likewise, some of them that some of the states that might be following portions of the PPP loan forgiveness statutes, they might not follow all of it. So, and I'm expecting that there's going to be a lot more information coming out from the states as we get closer to filing deadlines. So keep that in mind and make sure that you've left time to think about that when it's time for the filing season. Another area where we're seeing a lot of information coming out is about remote workers. And it seems to be getting a lot of headlines. And for those of us in state and local tax, this is nothing new. Um, people have been traveling and working remotely, but during the COVID time, it has gotten a lot of attention. And uh, there's a lot of questions around whether or not having a remote worker creates nexus and, and for which taxes it creates nexus for. So just as a reminder, all nexus is, is a fancy word for a connection. That means that an employer or a business, a company has enough of a connection with the state that the state can assert a tax over them. And when you have a remote employee in a state uh, that you have nexus, uh, there might be an exception to it, but it's going to create nexus for all the taxes that we've listed here. Um, from the employee standpoint, if they happen to be working someplace remote that's different than where they've been in the past, they also might have some uh, individual income tax filing uh, things to be thinking about. So when we've got a remote worker, oftentimes, um, if we can go to the next slide, there's there might be a protection or there might be some exceptions to having to file. For income tax, the most common one is for, or for companies that are selling tangible personal property that's shipped from another state. They might have some protection from income tax. I put sales tax on here. Uh, there's been a lot of attention around economic nexus or wayfair in recent years. And I oftentimes I find a disconnect for companies saying, well, I've got an employee there, but I don't meet the economic threshold. Well, that's, once you have physical presence, you have nexus. So the economic nexus doesn't override physical presence. It's an addition to it. So uh, what are the risks, or I'm sorry, what some of the protections that we have on the next slide are for states that have passed some sort of legislation regarding where do they stand if we've got a remote worker related to COVID. And you'll notice that the yellow is for states that have not issued any guidance, and that's the predominant color that's on the slide. What that means for those states is that it's business as usual. They are going to assume that it's income tax nexus and that it's sales tax nexus. A couple of states have said that nexus is waived and maybe they've waived it for income tax and maybe not sales tax. So again, when you're going through and you're doing your compliance work, your year end work, or um, that you're looking at maybe having to make fourth quarter payments, it'll be important to know if you've got any exceptions to filing. And um, on the next slide, I touch on the risk. And oftentimes there's a big disconnect between what the actual risk is and only having an employee in a state. Oftentimes I'm asked, well, or I'll hear statements that will say, well, I've only got one employee in that state. How, how much of a liability could there be? Well, that's, that's the disconnect. That's disproportionate. Once you have nexus, you have nexus for all of your activity. They don't prorate it based on just your one employee. Now for income tax, you do get to apportion your income. It could still be significant if it's if one of your largest customers or if you have a lot of sales in that state. I think the bigger risk is probably on sales tax. Sales tax is going to be on all your sales to that state. The average rate uh, across the country is probably a little bit higher than 77%. Pretty significant penalties and interest. They can be up to 50%. 
And all of that's coming out of the bottom line. You, you aren't, you know, you may have a chance to go back and get some exemption certificates. You may have a chance to go back and find out if your customers paid anything. But if the answer to all of that is no, or even if it's only a portion of it, all that's coming out of your bottom line. So on top of everything else, it's important for companies to get their arms around where were people located? Where have they been located? And oftentimes where are they gonna to continue to be located? Because a lot of our clients, a lot of companies have really embraced remote working. This is, the pandemic proved to them it can be done. So this may be an ongoing situation. And if we can have the next slide. So what do we do with our employees that are there? The employer is supposed to withhold where the employees performing the services uh, up. If an employee and the, and the company are in the same state, that's usually pretty easy, but what happens when an employee lives in another state and, or is traveling or telecommuting? Well, generally there are no exceptions or protections for an employee that's in a state that would uh, negate the employer having to do any withholding. And uh, there's, uh, Illinois has a, a small exception if you've been there for less than 30 days, the pandemic's been going for longer than 30 days, so I, I suspect that everybody's past that. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. And there are there's reciprocity between some states. And um, as we'll see on the next slide, there are some states that have passed exemptions for withholding. So both with reciprocity and with these exemptions, I wanna point out that these are state level and not city level especially with reciprocity. I find that catches a lot of employers by surprise. They, they're like, well, no, we've, we got reciprocity between these two states and the cities do not participate in that. Likewise, with the few states that we have that are highlighted in blue, where they're maybe changing where they're going to source where a remote worker is going to be required for withholding, that's gonna be at the state level. If there's city taxes involved, you would have to look into that. And if we can go to the next slide. And again, I get a, a lot of questions about, well, how big could the risk possibly be? It's one employee, it's a pretty low rate. Um, you know, I, what's, what are the chances of a state catching me? Well, the, the risk is probably, could be more administrative burden than, um, than the actual maybe dollar amount. The, the side, the, the, the way that states get a lot of attention um, around this issue is that there is personal liability for all responsible persons and corporate officers, similar to the sales tax. So, you know, oftentimes they might be the ones getting the notices. No one cares for that. Then it's a lot of administrative work to try to clean that up after the fact. I also, there's a disconnect that I hear oftentimes as well. I know all the tax was paid. My employee paid, you know, filed their income tax return and, and paid the tax. Well, that's not a defense for penalties for the employer who is supposed to withhold. I listed a couple of states that have pretty severe penalties, but I think that those are, are the outliers. But still be aware of it, especially if it's gonna be an ongoing issue. Some employees might've started working remotely because of the pandemic. And now, you know, now sometime in 2021, maybe when things are safe to go back to work, they've decided to stay at home and it just gets overlooked please make sure you've got procedures in place to be addressing these as, um, as we're making it through and transitioning back into the office. And another reminder, personal property tax, another one that kind of is overlooked, that's gonna be sourced to where the employee is using the property. And um, oftentimes, even outside of the pandemic, I often hear companies say, I don't really need to track it. I don't worry about it. I'm paying all my property tax to state or to city A. Well, that doesn't help city B where you were supposed to report it. And they don't, they're not friends with city A. So over-reporting to one jurisdiction doesn't cure the under-reporting in another. So this could be a real administrative burden tracking down where everyone is using uh, the personal property. And I was listening to a speaker the other day and he's like, you know, I don't really understand what the big um, concern would be because it's probably minimal. Well, it could be minimal jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but on a cumulative basis, it might not be minimal. And the flip side of it, at least here in Michigan, is there's a small, small parcel exemption. And by filing in all the different jurisdictions and getting your exemption in timely, it could reduce your overall tax burden. Now, uh, one thing to be aware of in Michigan, there is a COVID relief bill. 
that's trying to make its way through and it looks like it has support and might will likely pass. And that would be that for personal property tax in Michigan that you would report to the historic location. And they have a definition of historic location for people who might've been telecommuting or been in different locations, but that is, um, that's out there. But if that doesn't get passed, you may be facing a heavy burden or you may be facing an opportunity to, to uh, reduce your overall tax liability. And that's all I was gonna cover right now for state and local tax. I'd like to turn it over to Susan West. Hey, can I bug you for, we've had a few questions that are related to the same oh. issue. So if I can have you highlight those and I think we'll be able to get a few of those out. So Nexus, as it relates to independent contractors in other states and also PEO for employees, uh, other states. Um, you do have Nexus in um, another state. If you have a, a contractor, an independent contractor working in that state, who's fulfilling any of your requirements. So, uh, you know, one of the easiest things I can think of is service companies oftentimes will say, oh, we're gonna sell you this piece of property or, or maybe if we didn't even sell it, we offer this type of service, we will come fix a uh, broken pipe. And they contract, their contract with their customers, broken pipe is gonna be fixed. If an independent contractor is fixing that for you, you have Nexus in that state. So it definitely can give you Nexus, but not always. Okay, good. Um, I think I think that covered most of uh, of the okay. questions as it related. And I don't know, is it different for PEO? It is not. Okay, same same answer. Yep. Okay. All right, I'll let you take it back over. Okay. And I think we're up to Susan. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so we're talking about. Um, the whole area of human resources. Um, what I want to cover today is really giving you an, an update on some of the changing CDC guidance and what does that mean. Um, bit of an opening discussion on vaccinations and, you know, do you recommend them or do you require them as an employer? Um, and then lastly, just what are some of the expected changes coming in 2021? So first of all, COVID um, guidance has come out again from CDC regarding the quarantine. Um, you can now bring it down to a 10 day quarantine without some COVID-19 testing. My recommendation is please continue to have those one-to-one -one conversations with the employees, um, understanding their specific situation. And even though the CDC is updated, um, Michigan is still recommending the 14-day quarantine period unless there are uh, two conditions met. And so every state has some um, guidelines, so I want to make sure that you're still uh, looking on that or keeping up to date with that. And as you have those conversations with the individuals, make sure you understand um, what quarantine makes sense based on their particular situation. The other thing that I want to bring to your attention is, of course, we all know here in Michigan, there's been an extension of the uh, more of a um, stay, oh, I always forget the name of it, sorry, but <laughs> stay close, you know, uh, be careful of uh, the, the indoor gatherings, the number of people, you know, uh, we've all been impacted by that. But they've also put out a prohibiting um, a requirement or indicating it's a requirement that through the MIOSHA order, the emergency rule, that effective October 14th, COVID-19 prohibit, there should be a prohibiting in-person work policy <clears throat> defined. And basically the purpose of that is that you will prohibit in-person work to the maximum extent possible during the pandemic with the goal of keeping as many people as possible out of the workplace. Um, idea being that will help reduce the spread of the COVID-19 in the workplace. So the policy should clearly define the reasons why the in-person work is required, what specific role, whether it's a non-office position or an office position. This policy is actually due to expire in April 14th, uh, 2021, unless there's some additional update. So 
that is something that a lot of employers have not done. And I think uh, being prepared to recognize that this is a new requirement and starting to um, def define those specific responsibilities that require in-person work is gonna be your response if, if anything were to um, come as a result of an audit or an inspection. Ohio has, um, sorry, just a brief note there on Ohio. You know, they have um, some traveling restrictions. Their website really defines what, uh, which states are hitting that 15% or higher. And then um, the, new, the Ohio Department of Health had an, uh, a 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. statewide curfew through January 2nd. So every state has its, you know, um, idiosyncrasies, should I say. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> this is just a reminder, really, um, that the guidance continues to come up, the recommendations. Um, my whole goal of just sharing this slide is please make sure you're keeping your communication with your employees on your COVID-19 workplace preparedness response plan, keeping that updated, reminding employees of their responsibility, making sure that there's training and orientations on your COVID-19 uh, practices for new hires. And <clears throat> the other comment I wanted to make is we know that the Families uh, First Corona Response Act, FFCRA, and those leaves currently are defined to end December 31st. We expect there to be an extension, but there's been no news on that yet. So I recommend that all employers who have employees who might be on that Emergency Family Medical Leave Act due to childcare and COVID um, related issues, that you have conversations with those employees to indicate what, what happens if they're still on it December 31st. Now remember, you as the employer could choose to extend that, but the tax credit would stop. So it's a conversation that I recommend you have. We have no real indication of when an extension would come. And the other piece of the leave is the emergency paid sick leave. And if you have employees coming into play in the next week or two that would have eligibility for up to those 80 hours of uh, that kind of a leave, then that also is a discussion for you to have. What happens if you hit that 1231 mark and what action are you gonna take as an employer? Okay, now on to the vaccination um, discussion. Really, I recommend that you, you folks start having conversations around how do you plan for this? What questions do you need to ask? What's the impact to your customers? Well, first of all, your employees, then your consumers, the individual um, clients you have, your uh, visitors, and making decisions around are you going to choose to mandate a vaccination or are you choosing only to encourage um, employees to take it? We're, we all may already be experiencing how polarizing this topic is. Um, comments like, I would rather lose my job than get the vaccine. I would rather quit my job than be exposed to an unsafe workplace. If we <clears throat> take a look at the uh, next slide, we know that protecting the public outweighs employees' rights. And there's a lot of discretion in protecting the workplace. And based on the findings of the US Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC has determined that COVID-19 meets the direct threat definition. And therefore they're saying that employers can make a, a mandated requirement that employees uh, get the vaccination. So just trying to put some thoughts here in terms of a pro-vaccine kind of considerations, and then also a personal choice or a recommended position. Um, how do you begin to make these decisions? Some healthcare providers have already been in 
um, the space where they've mandated vaccines of other kinds in the past. But there's this a lot of wait and see. What does the um, a vaccine data going to tell us in terms of how long is it effective and at what point do you require the vaccine? Is it a return to work uh, scenario from a uh, from being off work? So all of those things to consider. If in fact there's a mandated position you take. What we need to understand is that the EEOC, although they say it can be mandated, they reckon, recognize that there are two accommodations that could happen. One is based on an employee with a disability that prevent them from receiving a vaccine. And the second under Title VII is that if an employee has a sincerely held religious belief that prevents them from receiving the vaccine. So the messaging there is that employers need to be prepared to have these kinds of discussions um, around um, making an accommodation and uh, be prepared for asking the right questions and holding the right kind of documentation, proving that you've been in an interactive process because that is one of the areas that is getting the most litigation right now, or a lot of litigation, is that employers are failing to engage in an interactive process with their employees. The last thing there, I guess, um, was just that employers would not need to accommodate uh, a secular or medical belief about the vaccine, much like under COVID, you, you um, don't if an employee fears COVID, it doesn't mean that they can't come to work. Um, it's similar here. If they have a medical belief about vaccine, it still doesn't mean that they'd be, um, um, they wouldn't have to still get the vaccine. It wouldn't be reason enough. So, um, okay. So the next slide, <clears throat> looking forward to 2021. <laughs> Wow, there's just a lot here and I'm, I provided a lot of um, bullet points. Um, I, I know going forward, especially after the Biden administration comes into play on January 20th, we're gonna see some pretty quick action in these areas. Um, I already mentioned the EEO focus on uh, disability discrimination, that interactive process. Um, so I want you to be aware that we, you need to be prepared to hold those conversations. Wage and hour, um, there were some planned increases. For example, here in Michigan, uh, the planned increase of the minimum wage from 965 has been delayed. We did not hit the under 8.5% unemployment we're waiting for the BLS to confirm that, but it it, it looks um, as though the minimum wage for Michigan will be um, delayed. Um, independent contractors could have new testing requirements in terms of look to California to see some of what they're doing. We expect to see possibly that come forward for all states. Um, pay equity, the whole EEO1 reporting, um, will be expanded back to possibly including paid data and um, also uh, be electronically reporting, allowing for uh, a bigger gathering of that data at the DOL. And then um, we're seeing under the Fair Labor Standards Act, some back to narrow definitions of exemption testing. So making sure that salary thresholds being met and then also um, making sure that you <clears throat> look at how those year end bonuses and discretionary pay is paid. We're gonna see some potential changes in that area. We do, ex we've already seen um, expanded state leaves, uh, both sick paid leaves, but there's um, some expectation that uh, the Family Medical Leave Act could be extended for all employees, not just for those employers over um, 50, 50 employees. And then workplace safety. Currently, we're seeing a lot of activity at the state level, 
um, there is an increased expectation that the federal uh, OSHA will have um, more to say. They've been fairly quiet under the Trump administration, but we expect to see some changes um, as um, the Biden team comes on board. Next, we have um, non-compete, non-solicitation agreements. Those are fairly common. There's a lot of bipartisan support for a narrow definition, lower wage earners being disqualified. Um, federal contractors have some new requirements. We anticipate the reversal of the sensitivity training plans. Um, <clears throat> On any investigations, the first question is what kind of training did the company implement? So being able to make sure that we're holding that in place, not only on the, the COVID side, but also on some of the state mandatory training around harassment or inclusion. Um, those federal contractors are pretty clear on what their requirements are. And then labor posters, lots of changes coming. Please make sure you have both your hard copy and, and a way to distribute those kinds of things electronically. A simple compliance area, but sometimes um, forgotten. Okay, so lots to cover there. I'd love to, uh, I'm happy to hand this off to Stephen Gibson, one of our talented associates here. So thank you, Stephen. Great. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Stephen Gibson. I'm a principal within our Raymond Wealth Group, uh, focusing exclusively on providing advisory services for retirement plans. Um, I want to say thanks for allowing me to, to anchor the, the presentation today. I like to think that I am the, the, the last bout of the fight card and what everyone's paid to see. I almost put in a poll at the beginning of this to, to see if anyone on here registered to see and hear about the retirement plan or whether it was PPP related items, but at the fear of significant disappointment, I elected not to, to put in that poll. Uh, I'm going to talk today about two big topics. One is understanding fiduciary risk uh, within your retirement plans and the second being retirement readiness. So really looking at what is a successful plan. The, the presenters that have already talked so far have covered a ton of information. So my goal today is to really leave you with two or three items of which you can take back, uh, bring to the appropriate people, or perhaps you are the appropriate person on, on ways to improve or streamline or benefit the overall retirement plan. Uh, the truth is, is that from a retirement plan perspective, oftentimes plan sponsors put this on the back burner. And that's where it sits uh, or on autopilot until every now and then it gets brought to the front burner, dealt with, and then pushed back. And that is presenting some risk, not only in 2020, where we've seen uh, almost 100 different lawsuits on uh, fiduciary breaches within retirement plans. Uh, there's more and more being filed all the time, um, but carrying into 2021, uh, we had the sunsetting provisions of of the CARES Act and the distributions. We had the SECURE Act and at the end of 2019, if anyone happens to remember that far back. Um, and looking at 2021, there's going to be more changes. Uh, the, the biggest one that just came out yesterday afternoon, uh, the DOL put out a prohibited transaction exemption um, for rollover advice within retirement plan um, advisors. However, that one is expected to be uh, effective 60 days after it's filed, that'll be filed here within the next couple of days. It's highly anticipated or expected that the Biden administration will have their inauguration before the 60 day deadline. They will pause, hold, bring it back and look on it. And the, the word on the street is they're going to make it tougher or, or more difficult or more strict, uh, which personally I think is, is a great thing. Um, so shifting over to understanding your fiduciary risk. Oh, sorry, go back, yep. Um, really, we're going to look and, and talk about um, a couple of items on this side. So where are plan sponsors finding themselves in the most trouble? Uh, the first bullet there, plan and investment expenses. This is where we're seeing a lot of the lawsuits uh, happen. They're still predominantly in larger plans. However, what we're seeing there is funneling down to what you should be doing inside of your own retirement plan as fiduciaries to lower uh, the risk. So for plan and investment expenses, 
if I were to ask you, could you articulate how much each provider receives in compensation? And not only uh, how much do they receive, but how they receive it. So is it coming directly from the funds that are being billed to the company? Understanding that and it's saying, is that the best choice or the most appropriate way? Uh, how are fees being benchmarked? Do you have a process in place where you're looking at plan costs on an annual basis and documenting that fees are reasonable to, for the services provided? Ways to lower this risk is exactly what I just said, document. Document, document, document. You should be meeting at a committee level um, or if you're a sole fiduciary by yourself and documenting that you've looked at these things as this is where a lot of the lawsuits have occurred is plan sponsors are failing to assess fee reasonableness. Uh, they're not looking at share classes of investments. So that's another big one where uh, you might be in higher cost funds without realizing that there's lower cost alternatives that are the exact same fund, just a different share class. And do you have a process in place to look at those, to say, here's why we chose the specific share class for each uh, particular investment. Uh, plan operations, while not necessarily heavily on the lawsuit side, this is where the majority of plan sponsors trip up uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and really there's a few major provisions within a plan that trip up uh, plan sponsors more often than not. The first one being definition of compensation. So understanding what is included and excluded in your definition of compensation for the plan. Should you be deferring on bonuses? What's the default? Is it zero or what they're putting in? Uh, moving expenses, post-separation compensation. This is one of the most frequently missed items. And while the correction isn't that big, it's the time that's involved uh, to making it right. Uh, another, a couple other plan operation items. One being employer matching contributions. So are your contributions being made on a per payroll or plan year basis? I do have a true up provision in place to where if you're making matching contributions, are you truing it up at the end of the year, making them whole? Um, shifting over to uh, the third bullet. So investment selection and monitoring. Being able to understand who are the fiduciaries on the plan. Is, is it just you or is it a group? Uh, and specifically, is the broker or advisor on the plan serving in a fiduciary capacity? Uh, if not, that's opening up for, for a little bit of a heightened risk, right? Because now the plan sponsor is the sole fiduciary on the plan, uh, being responsible for selecting and monitoring all of the investment options. And most plan sponsors, when they hear that, that's not a position that they want to be in. So understanding, are you in that position without even really knowing it? Um, we already talked about share classes, but the implementation vehicle. So there's been some lawsuits surrounding, you were in mutual funds, but you didn't look at collective investment trusts, or you were in separate accounts and you didn't look at mutual funds. There are different types of investment vehicles that can be in these retirement plans. You should be looking at every share class and every implementation vehicle for each fund in your plan to determine if that's the most appropriate. Uh, a red flag is if you're the only fiduciary on the plan responsible for selecting the investment lineup, your plan is that provider A and your, your lineup of funds are all provider A's funds or the majority of it. So you have a, a fiduciary responsibility to uh, offer your plan participants the best investment menu possible. And the way that I like to look at it is it's somewhat like fantasy football. And your friend is, has offered to, or wants you to draft their lineup, draft their roster. And you're sitting there on draft day, and you're, I'm gonna get you the best possible menu, the best possible lineup for this, for this team. And the next day when he asked how to go, you said you drafted the whole Detroit Lions team. So while there may be a couple of really good players on that team, it makes sense. Uh, it's, it's unlikely that every Detroit Lion player is going to be the best position in the best spot. So the same could be argued for a lineup with a lot of proprietary funds. And are you really showing the due diligence that uh, you, sh you should? I have required plan notices on here. Won't dive into that, but make sure that you understand who's delivering 
all of the initial and the ongoing required plan notices. The QDIA notice, automatic enrollment, SPDs, SARs, there, there's a ton of them out there and there's always, uh, there tends to be a lot of mix up between what the plan sponsors think the provider's doing and what the provider is actually doing. So getting that buttoned up for, for 2021. Uh, we just entered in a new restatement period. Yep, perfect on the next slide, where all of these plans are going to be restated over the next two years. And it's a very opportune time to take a look at your plan operations. How are we doing things versus how the plan says we're doing them and making any changes to align. You know, more often than not, these plans were set up and they might get one or two tweaks throughout the year, but there isn't that robust refresh, look at the plan design. Maybe your operations have changed and the eligibility shouldn't be one year, it should be six months, uh, for example. Uh, on retirement readiness, so this is one area where when 401k plans first started out and I have four minutes, so I'll be quick. Um, it was, hey, do you have a plan? Yes, great, that's a success. Nowadays, it's, are your participants on track to retire? And that's a much more complex question than what's the deferral rate and what's the participation rate for your plan? You know, the question now um, stems to, are they on track to replace X amount of, uh, of money in retirement? Providers have gotten really good at this and take the time and look at the details. Uh, education is no longer trying to get people to put in money and save. It should be targeted. It should be looking at specific employee groups. How do we identify them? Uh, should it be on demand? Should we offer virtual meetings? Should we have group meetings? Should we have meetings specifically for understanding social security and retirement income? You know, what do participants really want to know? Um, and, and there was a recent survey, and I don't recall where it was from, uh, but plan participants listed education as one of their top wants within small businesses. It's there, they're craving it, but they want more than just investing in retirement plans. And that's where financial wellness comes into play, right? If they're on track in retirement, but they're not doing the things outside of the plan, managing their debt, uh, taking care of their, their school loans, and who knows where that's going to be here next year, um, they're not setting themselves up for success. So it, instead of your typical education meetings, look at some alternative forms, right? Should we be talking about establishing a will or beneficiaries and how to set up you know, estate planning items? There's some great tools out there on the website. Take some time, look at them on, on your provider's website and find out how are we going to engage our participants in 2021. 2020, what we found out is when participants needed us most, which was when the, the shutdown occurred, uh, earlier on in the year, a lot of advisors or brokers had a hard time getting to those people because the, the standard measure that they were used to, they couldn't do. You know, they couldn't go to the workplace. They couldn't set up a group meeting. Uh, so in 2021, we expect that to continue. So look for ways in which uh, you can better engage your participants. I know that was, was quick. I'll leave you with a poll. This is the, the, the last poll of the day to see how many people are still on. Which of the following aspects of retirement plan intrigues you most? Now keep in mind, there could be 50 or 100 different ones on here, but I had to limit it down to, to four. Uh, I would love to, to do this again, to come on, to have a longer presentation. Uh, hopefully you all would be interested in it. And I appreciate everyone's time and I will kick it over to you. Well, let's see the answer first. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we're going to run the poll a little bit while longer. You can all see it on your screen while we pull up questions. You'll see that slide up there now. I know we answered a lot of questions throughout today's presentation. Um, much to Stephen's uh, regards about the Detroit Lions, this lineup was A+. plus. So thank you to all the speakers today. <laughs> we appreciate you and um, all of your knowledge. I know we answered some questions following each of the sections. Um, in the slide deck, you can see the speaker's contact information. So if there's anything that you wanted to follow up on, I know we had a lot of great questions coming in. Additionally, we are looking at our webinar lineup for the remainder of this year and moving into next. 
So make sure you're watching Raymond.com for those 2021 webinars coming up and additionally watching your email. So you'll be getting a copy of today's recording and slide deck. And with that, um, I think all of the questions have been answered. I know we've been sending out some links to additional resources. Um, John, any final statements? No, just highlight that um, uh, where they can obtain the slide deck and the um, recording. I think it was listed early on, but just make sure that they know that it's in that chat area and it'd be great. Thanks, Sam. Absolutely. Yep. The slide deck is um, available in the chat and will be emailed to you directly. So you'll get a copy of all these great resources, um, but we look forward to our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks.